All right, folks, page two. Uh, question six here says, determine if the function is a solution to the differential equation y double prime minus y equals zero. Uh, I throw this example in here because it just gives us a little practice of working with differential equations. Uh, it, hopefully you recall from what we talked about on the, on the first side of the notes that this is a second order differential equation. Second order differential equation because it has y double prime on it and uh, this question really just gets you used to working with differential equations. You're not asked to solve anything here. You're asked if this is a solution to y double prime minus y equals zero. And let me show you how we would approach that. We'd start by looking at uh, what's y prime? Well, the derivative of sine is cosine. And the second derivative would be negative sine of x. So now let's take what we know for y double prime and y and check to see if it's a solution to the differential equation. We have y double prime minus y equals zero. And this is something I'm gonna note here. We don't know if this is true yet. We're checking this with what we have for y double prime and for y. So y double prime is negative sine of x. I subtract y, which is sine of x. Uh, that's equal to negative 2 sine of x, which does not equal 0, at least not all the time. There are a couple solutions for that, uh, but not for all x. So our result here is that we would say no. This one is not a solution to the differential equation y double prime minus y equals zero. All right, let's go look at the next one, uh, which is y equals c times e to the x. Well, first we're going to check y prime. Let's see, we have some constant times e to the x, so that derivative is going to be that constant times e to the x again because e to the x is its own derivative. Second derivative is going to be same as the first. So let's go ahead and check. We're going to look to see if y double prime minus y equals zero. Substitute in what we know. y double prime is c times e to the x. y is that same c times e to the x. Does that equal zero? Yes, it sure does. So the answer to this one is yes. The function y equals c times e to the x is a solution to the differential equation y double prime minus y equals zero. All right, that was pretty straightforward. Let's move into number seven. We're given the differential equation x times y prime plus y equals zero. Uh, three different parts here. First thing is, what is the general solution to this differential equation? Uh, my dogs are interested in that. They're barking in the background. So uh, I'm going to go talk to them a little bit about differential equations, and I'll be right back. Okay, so the dogs and I talked and we got it all worked out. Ready to jump back into example seven here. First, we're gonna write the original differential equation, which was x times y prime plus y equals zero. Uh, through a little bit of algebraic rearranging here, I hope that you can see that this is equivalent to y prime equals the opposite of y divided by x. I wrote the differential equation in this form so we can see that we have uh, an x in the denominator there. We'll need to account for that later. Uh, but let's go ahead and continue with the right step here. I'm going to just change this to be x times dy dx plus y equals zero. The reason why I do that is just so that you can start to see the variables we need to separate. We have some x terms that we need to get to the right hand side of the equation. Uh, and then we have some y terms uh, that we need to, to keep on the left-hand side of the equation. This one we need to keep here. This one we might have to move first before we get it back to the left-hand side, and I'll show you what I mean there. So I'm first moving that y to the other side of the equation. Uh, now I'm going to take care of the dx. Uh, and now I'm going to divide both sides by y and both sides by x. And what we have is uh, separation of variables now. And, and I want to highlight one thing here. You may notice that I chose to keep this negative sign 
on the right hand side of the equation. I could have divided both sides by the opposite of y and that negative sign would have moved uh, with the y to the left hand side of the equation. But I'm gonna give you a piece of advice. Leave as much stuff on the right hand side as you can. Leave constants over there, leave negative signs if you can. That makes your job in the long run much easier. So that, I wanna make a little note of that here for you. All right, let's go back into our four step process for solving a differential equation. Uh, we're to the integrate step and I'm gonna just write that in here. And we already have our variables separated, so we need to take an antiderivative of the left and the right. And that's gonna give us the following. Okay, so I have the natural log of the absolute value of y equals the opposite of the natural log of the absolute value of x uh, plus some constant. I'm now to the rewrite phase of this solution. And what I'm gonna do next might not seem obvious. I'm going to exponentiate both sides of this equation that we have right here. So I'm going to take both the left and the right hand side of this equation and I'm going to make those the exponents on E. So I'm going to rewrite the left hand side except not in yellow. I'm going to rewrite the left hand side as E raised to the ln of the absolute value of y equals E to the negative ln absolute value of x plus some constant. Well, there's some work we can do now on the right-hand side of this thing. Uh, I sh we showed this earlier, uh, I showed you this earlier on page one. If I have e raised to some, some uh, expression that includes variables plus a constant, I can rewrite that as e to the negative ln absolute value of x times e to the c. What I'd like to do now is, is go back and I'd like to call this constant here c sub 1 everywhere that I used it. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because I'm going to now call this c. The other thing I want to do is I want to look at the opposite of the ln of the absolute value of x. I can rewrite that as the ln of the absolute value of 1 over x because I can treat that negative one coefficient out in front as an exponent inside the logarithm. X to the negative first power is one over X. Okay, so let's see what I'm left with now. E raised to the ln of the absolute value of Y is just the absolute value of Y. I hope you remember that from our properties of inverse functions, E and that E to the X and ln of X are inverses of each other. Now on the right hand side, what I have is my new constant C times E raised to the ln of one over the absolute value of one over X, which is just the absolute value of one over X. And, and I know this looks strange, but this is our general solution. And I think it's worth noting here, this is not in Y equals F of X form, but that's okay. It's the best we can do without more info. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and look at part B of this problem. Is the domain of the differential equation restricted? Is there anything in the solution we should consider? Okay, well we already, I, I alluded to the domain restriction in the original differ, differential equation earlier. Let's take a look at that over here now. The domain of the original differential equation, and that's, I, I know that this is what we think of as the original, uh, but we always need to consider if we solve for y prime, do we have any domain restrictions then? And yes, we do in this case, x cannot equal zero. Uh, now in terms of other considerations, let's think about this. We have uh, in our general solution, I'm gonna go back and, and highlight some things in the general solution now. We have the absolute value of y. And remember from our previous conversation, the absolute value of y equals y for y greater than or equal to zero, the opposite of y for y less than zero. We also have in our general solution, the absolute value of one over x. The absolute value of one over x is equal to one over x for x greater than zero. Notice I'm not including zero there. 
and it's gonna be the opposite of one over x for x less than zero. I'm writing those piecewise definitions out because when we go into the find, uh, when we go into write our particular solution um, through a given point, we have to consider whether or not y is positive or negative and x is positive or negative. Hey, that's what we're gonna do in the next uh, part of this problem. What is the particular solution through negative two comma four? So let's do our, our uh, substitution procedure here. We're gonna sub in x equals negative two and y equals four. So our general solution was absolute value of y equals some constant times absolute value of one over x. So because our y value is positive, y equals y. And because our x value is negative, the absolute value of one over x is equal to negative one over x. All right, let's go ahead and substitute in. We have four equals c times negative one over negative two. And solving this for c gives us c equals eight. Okay, let's go back to our general solution and what we now find for c and write our final particular solution. We're gonna have y equals negative eight over x comma, don't forget our domain restriction. We now have to pick a single open interval which contains the particular solution. We cannot cross over x equals zero because y prime is not defined at x equals zero. So we're gonna choose x less than zero because that's what our initial condition includes. And this is our particular solution through the point negative two comma four. All right, let's pause for a minute before here we before we jump into number eight. And I, I want to talk about this general solution just a little bit. Um, when I did the solution for this problem, I kept the absolute value functions intact, and I talked about uh, the piecewise definition of each, and I selected the the appropriate piecewise definition depending on what the, where the particular solution was located. What I want to do now is show you what some people will do as kind of a shortcut to all that work. Some people will do this. And in fact, in my notes posted online, I do this. I say, hey, uh, we can just write this as y equals the constant divided by x. And basically, it looks like we're ignoring all of the absolute values uh, on the left and the right-hand side of this. But I will tell you that they're not being ignored. It's just that we're not accounting for them explicitly. Um, the value of the constant C can be positive or negative, and that takes care of all four quadrants of X comma Y and the absolute value of Y versus the absolute value of one over X. Uh, I didn't go into that explanation in this video because I went through and explicitly showed you how to deal with the absolute value functions. I'll just tell you this. Whenever you see absolute value functions in a general solution, as long as you're not adding or subtracting the constant C, you can ignore the absolute value functions because the constant C will take care of any positive or negative values you need. And again, I'm saying that with, I want you to exercise great caution when you do that. We will see some examples throughout the rest of this unit where that is not okay because instead of having something like a constant times a variable expression, we might have something like this. And if you have something like that, there's no way you can just erase the absolute value symbol and say that the, the, the sign of the constant C takes care of it. So that's just a, a, a quick side note there. Let's jump back into problem number eight. So question number eight, we, say, we have uh, the statement, solve the differential equation, x times y prime minus three y equals zero. Uh, then we have our initial condition here of y equals two and x equals negative three. Let's go ahead and write our differential equation. So I have uh, x times dy dx minus three y equals zero. If we were to solve that for dy dx, we would get three y over x. Uh, and I'm doing that because we always want to start the first step of our problem. Uh, ex in fact, maybe I should even change it from write, separate, integrate, rewrite. It should be write, 
check for domain restrictions, separate, integrate, and rewrite. But that doesn't flow real well. So just know that this uh, check for domain restrictions in the differential equation is part of that right step. Uh, so for our, rich, uh, our original differential equation, dy dx, uh, x cannot equal zero. So when we choose a solution, we're gonna have to make sure that our solution does not contain x equals zero. So continuing with the right step of this, I'm gonna start working towards separation of variables. Uh, I'm gonna have x dy dx on the left. I'm gonna add three y to both sides. Uh, now I'm gonna say that we are in the separation stage because I'm going to write this equation with all the x terms on the right and the y terms on the left. Uh, so on the left, we'll have 1 over y dy. And on the right, I'm going to have 1 over x dx. And I know what you're saying. You're saying, oh, Mr. Rash, you forgot the 3. Uh, no, I didn't. I'm going to add it right now as a constant multiplier out in front here. Uh, remember in a previous problem where I said uh, uh, make sure you keep as much stuff on the right-hand side as you can. And by stuff, I mean constants and positive or negative signs. Okay, I'm going to incorporate the integrate step right in here. And I'm going to do that by writing in my antiderivative symbol. And that gives me the following on the left-hand side, the natural log of the absolute value of y. And on the right-hand side, I have 3 times the natural log of the absolute value of x plus our constant of integration. It's now time to rewrite this. And I'm going to use the same strategy I did in the previous problem. I'm going to exponentiate both sides. And we have e raised to the 3 times ln of absolute value of x plus a constant. I'm going to modify that a little bit. I'm going to say that's e raised to the ln absolute value of x cubed times e to the c. And what I'd like to do here is go back and let's just call that constant c1 everywhere so that now I can just call it c. Uh, you may also notice that I use the power property of logarithms here to say 3 times ln absolute value of x is really equivalent to ln of the absolute value of x cubed. From here, we're going to simplify. e raised to the ln absolute value of y is just absolute value of y. And the right-hand side of this is going to be my constant c times absolute value of x cubed. And that is our general solution. Let's go ahead now and try to find the particular solution through uh, the point negative um, three comma two. Okay, so we're gonna substitute in here x equals negative three and y equals two. Uh, we have a couple absolute value symbols here, uh, absolute value functions, we need to be careful there. Uh, we have the absolute value of x cubed uh, but we have x is less than 0, so that's actually equal to the opposite of x cubed when x is less than 0. Uh, we have the absolute value of y on the left, and the absolute value of y is equal to y for y greater than 0. So um, I could go through this problem and treat keep the absolute value functions intact through the whole thing, but I want to try the strategy I mentioned previously was I'm just going to let C take care of it and I'm going to show you what happens. Uh, so that means I'm going to rewrite my general solution as y equals the constant C times x cubed. I'm now going to substitute in the values for x and y. I have y equals 2 and we have x is negative 3. Uh, when we go ahead and cube negative 3 we get 2 equals negative 27 times c, and then we solve for c, and we get negative 2 27ths. So that's the value for constant c in our um, particular solution. Let's go ahead now and write this uh, particular solution in its final form. We're going to say y equals negative 2 over 27 times x cubed. We have to be careful here because we have this domain restriction we cannot cross over the asymptote of that differential equation. x equals 0 is the location of a vertical asymptote in that differential equation. We must avoid that at all costs, so we need to pick a single open interval that contains the initial condition. Well, the initial condition as x is less than 0, 
So we're going to state here x has to be less than 0 for this particular solution. And again, this is the particular solution through the point negative 3, comma 2. And if you want, as I'll leave this as an exercise to the reader, if you want to go back through and solve this with the particular solution, uh, starting with the, the this situation where I leave, where you leave those absolute value symbols in, uh, you're going to get the same particular solution as long as you're careful with the piecewise definitions of those absolute value functions and solving for the constant. All right, folks, that's it for uh, the first introductory lesson in our study of differential equations. I wish you luck and stay tuned. The next lesson will be coming up shortly. But you now are armed and dangerous enough to work on the first web assign for this chapter.